So, so can you please tell me your name, where you live and work? Um, yeah, George Burns, and uh, in West, Perth, Western Australia. Yeah, and, and what do you do? Um, a clinical psychologist, um, adjunct professor at uh, Ken Miller Institute in Melbourne, uh, adjunct senior lecturer at Edith Cowan University, but um, I've recently stepped back from consulting clients to focus my attentions mainly on to, to writing, uh, to teaching and to doing volunteer work So in, in, in clinical psychology. So they're the three areas that I'm, I'm now focusing on. Right, right. And, and, and what's your background for, for doing that? Um, background is as a clinical psychologist. Um, I, I graduated in 1968, so um, had, yeah, frighteningly more than 40 years of, yeah. of, of working in, in clinical psychology and, uh, and, and, and miss it and uh, miss seeing clients. Yeah. Um, but it's uh, yeah, a transition where I'm, I'm able to focus on other things that I also equally enjoy doing, which, yeah. is, which is good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and so how did you get into positive psychology? Um, I, I, I've been interested in that long before the Martin Seligman ever coined the term. Yeah. And um, even in my student days, I don't think I was all that happy as a person with the pathologizing of, of clients, um, the diagnostic labeling of them. I mean, it was very interesting. And I, I was brought up in a school that was uh, very psychodynamic actually, uh, but somehow that never fitted and, and when I graduated, I, I graduated from Melbourne University, I, I went to Tasmania in my first job as a psychologist and there I was dealing with people that were practical people, they were farmers, they were uh, small business people, they were shop attendants, they were housewives, they were um, people who were facing practical situations in life and wanted practical solutions and I found that my skills in offering four years of psychoanalysis didn't match with the clients that I had. So. I started to search through a whole variety of uh, theories and therapeutic approaches and it was when I came across the work of Milton Erickson uh, from, uh, from Phoenix in Arizona uh, and, and that was through because I was working with hypnosis and became aware of him in the hypnosis areas. Yeah. But Erickson, who I, who I really think was the father of positive psychology, even though the coin wasn't developed then, I mean, he, he didn't take the research, he was research oriented, but not the research that we see coming out of Seligman's work and, 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 and you know, the initial now terms of positive psych. But Erickson was the first person that really legitimised for me that happiness could be a, a therapeutic goal. Yeah, yeah. Um, he was somebody who looked at clients' resources. He he didn't say what was wrong with this person. In in fact, in my last book, uh, Happiness Healing Enhancement, his uh, daughter wrote a chapter for that, and she entitled her chapter "What's Right with Him," yeah. and and not "What's Wrong with This Client," yeah, yeah, but yeah. "What's Right with This Person." Yeah. And that was Erickson's approach. He said, you know, what are their resources? What are their strengths? What are their abilities? How can we utilize the things this person's doing well to help them solve this set of problems to better able to solve the problems in the future? Yeah. So, yeah, I think Erickson's approach fitted with my own thoughts about life. And, um, and, and so had me working in that area and learning from him and his work uh, though, though he'd passed on when I first became interested, but watching videos of him, learning from his books, going to conferences, and um, and, and then when Seligman started to give the label positive psychology and get now what's a good growing solid body of research in the area, again this was just a natural flow. So, yeah, 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 yeah. so it's it's been a gradual sort of movement for me in that uh, and and and. And long been what I'm doing, as I said, long before the term of positive psych came up. Yeah, yeah. And and the, the people who who you help, like what what kind of people are they, and 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 what kind of issues do they have? The the people that I've seen through my practice over the years have have been general, and and I 
very much wanted to keep my private practice that way. I have worked in various government agencies before going into private practice, uh, but I, I didn't want to be seen as a specialist in depression or anxiety or phobias or psychoses or anything else. I mean, I, I've always enjoyed not knowing who the next person is that's going to step through the door or what sort of challenge they're going to present uh, for us to be able to work on in a collaborative way. And, um, and so I've, I've probably specialised more in therapeutic approaches, in working with hypnosis, in working with solution-focused approaches, in working with family-oriented approaches, in working with Ericksonian approaches, and working with positive psychology, and, um, and uh, nature-guided therapy, which is something that I've written about. Um, and, and also, an interest has been, how do you communicate that effectively with clients? And so that's been the topic of three books on metaphors. Uh, so, so yes, I've, I've not focused specifically on, on problems, but really wanted to look more at outcomes and the means that best help someone to get to that outcome. Yeah, yeah. And, and so, so the, when you, s like, like the last 10 years uh, after positive psychology uh, uh, showed up uh, with that label, and, um, have you had specific clients where you use specific things from positive psychology? Certainly, yeah. And I, I think they've, um, these are not things that I probably wasn't doing before, the things that I probably was doing. But I think the research now has helped confirm, has helped validate uh, some of the techniques that we know work. and. Um, and it's allowed me to use those, probably with greater research confidence behind yeah. me, uh, to be able to, to yeah, offer to people. Right, right, right. And, and when, when people come to you, how, how would that look like? What would uh, an engagement look like? Like what would happen before they meet you? What would happen the first time they meet you? Um, what would happen before they meet me is that they um, uh, usually make a booking uh, through my secretary um, who's well trained in my approaches and well trained in helping to set positive expectations with people right the way on the phone um, and to feed back to me information that she gains about that client before I actually see them. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm wanting too to start to set that positive expectancy as, as soon as uh, as soon as I can with someone because I think expectancy is a very important variable in in therapy yeah. and um, and you know if your therapist hasn't got hope for you yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're in trouble yeah yeah yeah. Um, and I, I, yeah, if I can give an example, I mean, one area that I have worked with is hypnosis uh, to help people give up smoking, to become smoke free. Yeah. And again, I want to use the more positive language on that. Um, it so happened that a medical practitioner uh, here, uh, a guy who referred uh, clients to me, came to see me himself and successfully stopped smoking. Yeah. Now, he referred people saying, I went to see this guy in the city, he helped me to stop smoking, um, you know, I'd recommend you go and see him too. The expectancy set was there yeah, yeah. and was high. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm not sure I needed to do anything because they, <laughs> they came with that already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I want to help um, from my secretary in first contact to meeting me help build that expectancy set. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the um, usually when I first meet people, I uh, undertake what I have called an outcome-oriented assessment. I'm not at all interested in taking a long, detailed history. Um, people will tell me their story, and I think it's very, very important that a therapist you respectfully listen to that story. And there's a criticism I often get about positive psychology. Um, I've had colleagues say, you're a superficial therapist because you don't go and inquire about all these things. Um, and, um, and, and, you know, positive psychology is often seen as, you know, you, you get on with it, you know, forget about the past. But the past is important to someone. It's brought them to where they are at the moment. And, and if, if they need to tell and share that story, I need to hear that story. Yeah. 
But above that, I want to hold the paradigm that we are moving forward. And, um, and that's where, you know, I, I want to get a clear assessment of where someone wants to go. Yeah, so what, what would happen after you've done this uh, assessment? After, after I've got the assessment of where a person wants to go, I want to explore with that person then the, the best strategies, the best means. I mean, this fits in a bit with hope theory. Yeah. You know, we, let's define the goal. Let's see where someone wants to go, and it's a bit like getting in your car. If you don't know where you're going, you know you're not likely to end up there. No. Um, and once you've decided where you want to go, then you need the pathways and the means to be able to get there. Which roads do I take? Which streets? You know, do I get in a car? Do I go by train? Do I take a plane? Um, so the next step to me in therapy is really helping a person to find those pathways. What are the strategies? What are the in interventions? What are the techniques? that's going to be helpful for this person to reach this specific goal. And then to look at building the agency, the um, not, not really motivation, I don't quite like that word, but, but the tapping into their resources that they can utilise to empower them to get to that point. Yeah. So that's the um, broad overall picture of where the therapy sessions would go. And what, what would happen between the sessions? Um, I invariably give people homework assignments to work on um, and, um, and I, I think that this is important for, for many reasons. Um, you know, we can sit and we can talk as the old saying is till the cows come home. Um, unless that's applied and put into practice, it doesn't necessarily make a difference. Yeah. So I want to give people things that they can work on uh, between now and the next time they come to see me. Um, I'm very thorough on wanting to check out when they come back exactly what they've done. I don't want to let that assignment, that homework assignment just slide by. Mm. We need to pick it up, we need to make sure that somebody's put it into practice and if they haven't, um, you know, what else might be helpful if that hasn't? Um, if what they've learned from it, what they've gained from it, how can we build on that? Yeah. So uh, those between session uh, exercises I think are very important things. Yeah. So yeah, change is not um, doesn't happen. I just just necessarily through a conversation. Change may happen through a conversation, um, but like any learning experience that we have, and therapy is about learning, about yeah. learning new ways to deal with old issues. Yeah. Um, if it is a learning experience, uh, I want to facilitate that learning for my client as much as possible. Yeah, yeah. And and how would you end an engagement? Um, when. Um, you know, probably when we've got to a point that that person is saying, I don't need to see you anymore, you know, and um, and, and let me say my work is usually very brief. Uh, when I was seeing clients, the average number of sessions I had with a client was just on four sessions, and I've kept stats over the whole of my practice on the number of people that I've seen, how many sessions I've had with them, and um, uh, and so then you go don't build up dependency problems or yeah. um, or that, that that are there. I'm wanting to empower people to get on and work as much as they can. Yeah. Um, I want to know let them know too that the door is open if they want to come back, so they don't feel that they're thrown out and on their own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but the option is there if if they they want to do some more work. Of course, I mean you know that's, that's uh, how long's a piece of string. I mean you never know how long. A, therapy is going to be for. No. Um, but uh, yeah, when somebody is feeling, hey, I can manage this, or I'm doing much better at this than I was, uh, I want to really encourage that, really empower that, and, and encourage that person keeps going on that themselves. Yeah, yeah. You, you mentioned the assessment, uh, the outcome-based uh, assessment. Mm -hmm. Can you say something more about that? Yes, I've, um, as I said, I don't want to take a history at all, you know, you will get some history from what your client says, but you know, that's where a person's been and, and what really is important is where a person wants to go. Um, it's something I've written up and given case examples of in some of my books, but um, in one, 101 Healing Stories, um, it, it is described there and, and fairly succinctly. And, and to me, this is a basis of doing any good therapy. 
of really getting clear definitions of where your client wants to go so that you've got good approach goals for them. Yeah. And um, the first step um, is, is I think for you as a therapist to have an outcome oriented approach yourself. Um, and this is a positive psychology approach. Um, have the approach of looking where you're going, not where you, you, you or your client has been. Um, again, you're going to get information about where they are at the moment, but the, the future is where we're all going. Yeah. And so I think it's good to have that outcome oriented approach, the paradigm of positive psychology. Yeah. Um, Closely related with that too is, is having an outcome oriented assumption and that is to assume that my client can change situations, circumstances, attitudes, behaviours, feelings, emotions from where they are at the moment toward where they want to be. Yeah. Um, to have that a realistic assumption that an outcome is indeed possible. And I say very realistically there that, you know, we need to match goals in reality and not in fantasy. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, 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 as a therapist, want to have that assumption because if I've got hope and positive expectations for my client, I think that's going to facilitate them having better levels of hope. And again, there's, there's research in these areas to show that that's so. Yeah. Um, given that approach and that assumption then, um, the, the next step is really to examine the goal and, and let's say we've got someone who's depressed, if you, if you ask them what do you want to achieve out of therapy, they may well come up with a, a, a goal that says, well, I, I don't want to be depressed anymore. Yeah. Um, they'll often frame that in the negative, and that's very understandable, you know, you have a stone in your shoe, um, you want to take your shoe off and stoke, shake the stone out, yeah, yeah, you, yeah. you want to get rid of the negative. And, um, and so I'll, I'd want to shape that with a person to see, well, if, that's, if you don't want to be feeling that way, if you don't want to be feeling depressed, how do you want to be feeling? Yeah. And when you ask a question like that, people will often come back with a global type response. Yeah. I want to feel happier. Um, but for you as a therapist to aim with them and, and for them as a client to have that, it's like um, having a whole blank wall in front of you and say, throw a dart at it and hope you hit a target there yeah, that yeah. is somewhere on the wall. Yeah. Um, it's too big, it's too diffuse. So I, I, I really want to break that down. Yeah. Um, what's the specifics? What are the specific goals that you want to achieve? How do you want to feel? How do you want to think? How do you want to be behaving that's different from what you have been? Um, and you know, there are many things with depression. It may be cognition, it may be affect, it may be behaviour, there may be all of these. Um, and break it down, get it specific, get it more specific, because if you get it very specific, um, then you've got a target you can move into and you can start to work with. Yeah. And even if a person just practices at changing one little thought they've been having or doing something slightly different during the week, you start to make some forward movement. Yeah. And as soon as you get that forward movement, um, then I think it's very important to, um, to start to validate and ratify that. Um, have an anticipation that your client can take that step forward and give them plenty of accolades, pat them on the back. You know, if I see a phobic patient who's frightened to get on an aeroplane and go somewhere, um, and they, they need to be doing that for business, for family reasons, for a mother who's ill and close to dying back in England or something, um, I want to get them to send me a postcard when they got there. Yeah. You know, let me know that this has happened. That helps validate it for them. I can sit down and write out, I've made the flight. It was scary, it was exciting, it was whatever, but I'm here, I've done it. Yeah, yeah. You know? So I want to get that validation from yeah, people. Yeah, yeah. Often just simply going through this assessment um, is enough to empower people to start to make the changes for themselves. Yeah. Often that can be enough in itself. And and the assessment is that a structured interview or how, how does it happen? 
It's a very stru semi-structured interview. It's just on those sort of principles, those guides that I've given you there that I've, I've mentioned. And um, of course, it's very flexible. And of course, it varies with every client you see. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Um, and, and you may find that you start with a global goal and get down to specifics and you come back to something global and you have to work through that process again. And it doesn't necessarily follow a straight linear path. Right, right. But if you've got these, these principles in mind and these core steps for taking that, um, then it's easy to, to flow with it and yeah. with your client on yeah, that. Yeah. Do you use other types of assessments? Pretty much not in latter years. I mean, previous years I, I have done. I've done through all the psych testing and everything else. And, uh, and um, uh, been through all those processes that we all do in this game. Um, but, uh, you know, for many years, pretty much all I've done is, is uh, use that outcome-oriented assessment. Yeah, and what's your thoughts on not using other assessments but this one? Um, I, I like to keep it simple. Um, and, and I find that this approach is, uh, generally gets enough information and starts to empower people to think positively, to think of goals, to think of pathways, to find agency, to start to move to, to where they want to get. And um, so if you've got something that's doing that and helpful to a client, I mean, why do you need to do anything else? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, they'd uh, be more time consuming, they'd be, um, yeah, they might add information, but uh, information is only valuable if it facilitates change. Yeah. Uh, I don't feel I need to gain a lot of information to help someone facilitate the changes they want to. Right, right, right. What about interventions? Do you use some positive interventions? Yes. Uh, a range. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which ones? Well, um, you know, where do we where do we start with that? I, I, I would like to think that all the interventions that I, I use are, are positive. Um, as I've mentioned, I um, do a lot of work with hypnosis. I train colleagues in hypnosis, work with hypnosis with clients, and uh, the value that I find in that is that hypnosis is a very positive process in itself. Uh, if you look at the phenomena of hypnosis, they very closely parallel the characteristics that Mike Csikszentmihalyi defines uh, as being flow. So just by the process of doing it, you're creating flow experiences, you're creating engagement, you're creating mindfulness processes. Um, mindfulness is another one that I use with and separately from hypnosis. I, yeah. I think hypnosis is a mindful process and probably in many ways more therapeutically targeted than just mindfulness. Um, and, and though I know people will disagree with me on that one, but um, um, I you know, use, use interventions that look at relationships. You know, use interventions that given the circumstances where that person um, looks at spirituality, um, look at interventions that look at cognitive change and, and shifting um, certainly some of the things that we know with depressed people in terms of global and specific thinking and things like this. Um, look at goal setting with people, uh, the various sorts of goals and that will usually come out of the outcome oriented assessment. Um, I look at tapping into strengths, I uh, really like, like Alex Lindley's work. Um, in, in strength spotting yeah. and uh, find it very useful to have have clients spot their own strengths and spot strengths in others and useful for me as a therapist to look at spotting my clients' strengths. Yeah. Um, Alex and I co-wrote the chapter, the opening chapter to my last book, uh, Happiness, Healing and Enhancement. And there's a very, very good reason I have it as the opening chapter, yeah. because I think it's a very positive, very useful, and very empowering technique for people yeah. uh, to be strength spotting. Um, so, you know, I could go on and list heaps of them because I'm, um, I really want to individualize those with clients. So the sh sessions will vary with every person I see, yeah. um, but these are there at the core. Um, and as you know, another core of my work too is not just the interventions, but really how we communicate those interventions. Because um, 
if someone is depressed, they've often been given good advice. Uh, pull up your socks, get on with life, find a hobby, become physically active, um, you know, get out and meet some friends, do things like this. I mean, this is sound advice and fits in with research that we know well. Um, but the person hasn't taken that on board and hasn't incorporated that. Mm. It's not because the techniques are not good and sound, but somehow they've not been communicated to that person in a way that's effective for that person to absorb them, take them on board and start to put them into practice. Yeah. So a lot of my therapeutic interest uh, has been in the use of suggestion and the use of indirect suggestion and the use of paradoxical suggestion, the use of metaphors and storytelling um, that helps engage a client join them in their world, in their language, in their styles of communication to be able to bring through the interventions that we know yeah. can be effective and do work well. Yeah. And so that's the subject of three books on, on, yeah. on metaphors. Yeah. Um, how do we communicate effectively yeah. the things that we know work? Uh, and to me that's, that's the real art of therapy. Not, not just knowing what works but knowing how you effectively get that through to a client. And, and what, what could be just one example? Um, one example, uh, uh, well, you know, we, we learn through stories. Stories are an effective way of communicating. And, um, I, I, I mean, let's take an example at, um, at school level. Um, a teacher writes up on the board for a kid who's there at school, one plus one equals two and you're a little Johnny five or six years of old age and these symbols are up there and maybe they don't make any sense or meaning to you. But the teacher sits down and says, well, little Johnny went home after school and he was feeling hungry, so his mother gave him one biscuit. And after he'd eaten that one biscuit, he still felt hungry, so his mother gave him another biscuit. So one biscuit plus one biscuit equals two biscuits. Now. The message of both of those is exactly the same. Yeah. But, you know, were you in little Johnny's place, the story about getting the biscuits and tapping into the feelings and experiences that he has communicate that more effectively yeah. um, than just writing those symbols on the board. And so I think it's the same in therapy. You know, you could say to the depressed person, go home and exercise more. Or you can say, well, you know, I once met another client who was in a very similar situation to you. And she tried this and she tried that and she tried this and some of these things worked and some of them didn't. And, um, you know, but give that as a story that perhaps fits into that person's experience. Yeah. That it's going to be easier for them to find their own solution in that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that, yeah. And, and when do you know which interventions to, and if, if I go back to that, what, when do you know which one to use for which client? <laughs> or how that's, do you know? That's an interesting question in itself. Um, because you, you never really know until after you've offered it and it works or it doesn't. Right, right. And, and, and it's only then that you have the feedback. You know, I... Um, I, I gave the example of Milton Erickson's work before and um, Erickson, a lot of people look on him as having a lot of insight and, and a lot of power in being able to offer interventions to people. But I, I personally think he was just a very keen observer. And somebody once asked him what were the three most important variables in therapy and he said observe, observe, observe. No. Um, Watch your client, learn from your client, learn the things that you know are going to be most helpful for them, and you will get that from the outcome-oriented assessment. Yeah. You know, if somebody says, "Well, I'm likely to be feeling happier," you know, if I had more friends in my life, well, here's here's a chance to offer some interventions. Yeah. You know, how do you see you could start to build greater friendships? Yeah. and look at the various things to, to be able to do that. Look at John Gottman's work on the sort of things that make relationships effective. 
How can you start to incorporate those? Can you form an interest club? You know, can you ring an old friend that you haven't before? Can you send a letter of gratitude off to somebody that you appreciate has done something and, and start to renew or build that friendship again? Um, so I think it's hearing what your client wants, observing carefully uh, the things that are likely to work for them, drawing on the expertise, knowledge that you have, and really making that as an offering to somebody and see what happens. Um, you know, if they come back the next week and said, well, I rang up a friend, but she was too busy to meet for a cup of coffee. Um, you know, do you see that as a failure or do you see that as a success? You know, your client didn't make contact with that other person, but she has rung them up. Yeah. She has taken that initiative. She has made a step in that direction. She has followed through on the suggestion that you offered. Um, yeah. How do I expand on this? Yeah. How do I now build on this with this client? Um, and so, you know, it's, uh, it, you know, it's important that we have that positive attitude ourselves, I think, and, and look at, well, whatever comes out of this, it's an experiment. If I offer an intervention, uh, it is an experiment. I don't know how it's going to go. Right, right. But how do I use it once that person has or hasn't engaged in it um, makes the therapeutic difference. Right, right, right. And, and, and so how do you choose to use it? Like, are there rules of thumb for what you can do when, when people come back yeah. and, and you get the feedback? Well, if, if somebody comes back and says, you know, I failed, it didn't work, I want to explore that a bit more. You know, what did you do? What went on? You know, is this the depressive thinking that's talking? And as I said, if they've, you know, they've rung up somebody and that friend said, no, sorry, I'm too busy at the moment, I can't meet you for a cup of coffee. Um, you know, yeah, you know, look at how you use it. Uh, what has your client done? How can you help them build on that? How can you help them realise that, well, that's life, not every situation works. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, if, uh, if a client hasn't done the exercise at all, um, then I would like to say, well, what, what is going to work for you? What's something that you think would be more helpful? You know, if this one was hard for you to engage in, what else might be, be working, work, worth working for? You also mentioned earlier the, about pathways and agency that, that you had in the assessment. How, how do you talk about that? Um, well, pretty much um, through the assessment as I did. And one thing that I, I um, uh, will invariably ask in the assessment, I didn't mention that in the outcome assessment, I, I, I will ask what people see that they are good at. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and, and sometimes you get the response from a depressive person, well, I'm not good at anything, you know, um, you know nothing. Um, I've always been a failure. Um, but you, you start to explore that. I mean, we don't get to adult stage in life without being good at some things. No. Uh, even if it's... And, I, and let me make a point here too, because I think this is an important one. Even if it is good at thinking depressive thoughts, uh, now, symptoms can often be a resource. Symptoms can often be a strength. Right. Um, and we, we often miss that as therapists. Um, uh, if a person can feel intensely feelings of depression, we know something important, and several things important. We know A, they can feel, we know B, they can feel intensely. If it's possible for them to feel intensely and in a negative way, then is it also impossible or possible for them to feel intensely in a positive way? Huh? Might that intensity of their feeling be something that they can utilise? Yeah, yeah. When else have you felt in, in intense feelings? Yeah. So, um, so, yeah, you know, we. Um, so I want to explore their strengths, and I and I and I want to see that maybe sometimes symptoms are strengths too. Um, that there might be something you know in that that a person can can use. Um, another question I always ask invariably is, what do you do for fun? Um, and again, you get somebody who's really depressed and fun, don't talk to me about fun, I never have any fun. <laughs> um, but, you know, here's sometimes where I will explore back. Because I'm not exploring back into past pathology, but I'm exploring back into past resources. Yeah. What have you done for fun in your life in the past? When have you enjoyed yourself? 
And you know, there are times when we've all had those moments of delight, of joy, and even in the most depressed states, um, sometimes something comes through that we might have a laugh about, or you know, a beam of light shines down through the dark clouds in the sky. Um, some, something is different for us. Yeah. And, um, and you know, and if a person is not feeling um, fun, enjoyment, joy in their, their present, then when have they done it in the past? Or when do they see they might be able to do it in the future? Um, so I think I might have moved away from your question there a bit, but... Um, yeah, yeah. Um, the pathways and agency, like how to build that? Yeah, so as, a, as an aside, I want to explore strengths and I want to explore what a person does for fun and enjoyment, pleasure uh, in their life because these are things that will often provide the pathways. Right, right, right. right. Once you've got the goals, uh, then you start to explore with someone, well, how do you see you might get to that goal? Yeah. What are the strengths that you've got that you can utilise, uh, enable again if you haven't been using them for a while to start to move in that direction? Right, right. And, and the agency? The agency really comes down to some of these things like fun. That's one reason why that question is there. Um, and, I, and I don't think it's a question of motivation. You know, again, you get somebody who's depressed, well, I don't feel motivated, I don't want to get out of bed, I don't want to do anything. Um, and, and I'm not sure how you lift motivation or how you encourage person to suddenly become motivated. Um, but if you can start to tap into the things that they get enjoyment out of doing, yeah. um, is it helpful to give a, um, a, a, a case example yeah, 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 there? Please, please. Um, probably one of the most depressed people I ever saw, and, and I've written her case up in my book with her permission, um, Healing with Stories, and um, uh, extremely depressed woman, um, they at first thought that she was suffering dementia and sent her to see a neurologist who, um, who thought that it might be depression masking, a 50 year old woman, depression masking as, as dementia um, and uh, so referred her to my practice. Um, she actually went to see one of my associates who does do a lot of psychometric testing um, uh, found that there was nothing cognitively wrong, no evidence of dementia whatsoever, found she rated extremely high on the depre uh, Beck Depression Inventory and uh, so referred her to me for, for therapy. And um, she started to tell me, she, she was one of those cases where, um, and I, I don't know if you have them or if other people have them, where you sit down at times and think to yourself, where the hell am I going to go? Yeah. And, you know, and she was one. Yeah. You know, she started to tell me about the childhood history of abuse. She started to tell me about the, the father who abused her, but her mother had now died and she and her husband had moved into the father's house to look after him because he was aged. Um, because of the history, she didn't want to be there, yeah. but felt it her duty as a daughter. Uh, she had four children. Uh, two of them had suffered with Cushfeld Jacobs disease and there were contaminated batches of the treatment. Yeah. And so she was frightened that they might get have had the contaminated treatment and die. Yeah. Um, very realistic fears. She got all the CJD newsletters. She read all the depressive stuff all the time. Um, in many ways, she was like a um, universal mother. I think she had a nephew who had leukemia and was dying. She had some other family member who got AIDS and she was visiting them in hospital. Uh, she'd been in two motor vehicle accidents and had some serious physical injuries herself. I mean, the story just went on and on and on. Yeah. Um, and in that first session, um, I, I started to explore with her this question of, well, what do you do for fun? And when I said before about not using inventories or anything, one other inventory that I will use at times that I've written up in my book Nature Guided Therapy is a sensory awareness inventory. And, um, and I did that just verbally with her, asking about her senses and the things that she got pleasure out of. And she talked about her roses. She loved her roses. Um, she, she loved um, 
tending the roses, pruning them, smelling them. And so in that first session, I just asked her to go home and spend some time with the roses. Here's a resource. Yeah. Yeah. Just to start to tap into some pleasurable, positive feelings. The, the, the P in Seligman's Perma yeah, 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 um, yeah, yeah. is the beginning. Yeah. And um, I don't know if you um, wanted to edit this, but I could actually read the letter she wrote back to me. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so I simply asked her to go home and spend some time with the roses to help build those, those well, tap into those positive emotions. Um, she travelled in by train to her sessions to see me. Uh, she did speak of suicidal ideation during that first session. And as I later discovered, she was a prolific letter writer. She wrote me a letter after every session <laughs> and talked about it. And the first letter from this extremely depressed lady who had some very damn good reasons to be depressed. Uh, she came back, yesterday I was so embarrassed, yesterday was the day of her appointment with me. I got such a shock that I wished myself anywhere but there, and this was a reference to her suicidal thoughts. But it was so funny, when I was on the train later, I was sitting there visualising making my husband rose petal sandwiches, marinating his meat in rose perfume rose petals in the stew, lighting rose candles, sprinkling rose petals all round the room, some other ideas I won't write down. So she starts to bring in some humour mm -hmm. um, into this. She said, I started to giggle. People too, uh, sitting ne too, next to me and opposite me moved away and put a lot of space between us. All were giving me funny glances. By the time I got off the train, I was laughing out loud while walking down the street. I found a freedom of spirit that hasn't been there for a long time. Thanks for letting me find my own way through it. The roses are a great idea. Um, and so this was just tapping into one specific little resource that she had yeah. um, that became a, a significant turning point for her in the course of therapy. And. Um, so I don't know whether that gives an yeah, example in, yeah, yeah, in answering yeah. your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What about uh, sharing knowledge? Like, do you share knowledge with clients? Like you, you, you said you shared a story of a previous client. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and, and sharing knowledge can be in stories too. Yeah, I recently got back from this conference in America. I mean, that always holds a lot of weight. <laughs> And an expert there that I went to was talking just about the sort of things you're describing to me. And um, he was saying that, dot, 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 dot. Yeah. Um, so, yes, I, I will, in metaphors and in stories, uh, share that sort of information. And, and this depends on your client, too, of course. Um, I, I mean, if you've got a client who's a professional person and has studied at university, Sometimes you can just come straight out and say, the research shows that, you know, if you get out and do five minutes exercise each day, you're going to feel better. Yeah. Um, and some people are happy to take that on board. If that works, great. Um, so yes, I, I certainly share, um, share the knowledge that we have as professionals. I, I, you know, I want to work collaboratively with my clients. I want that to be an interactive process between the two of us helping to move towards their goal. And I believe that one of the reasons that people come and have come to see me is because they, they want that knowledge. Yeah. yeah. They come to me because my professional life has been learning about these things. They come because they want to gain something from that. So, of course, I'm happy to share that. Yeah, yeah. And, and is there any specific time in, in the session that you share knowledge? Like are there some cues or triggers that now you share knowledge instead of asking a question or, or doing an intervention or...? Yeah, um, Milton Erickson made many famous quotes and one quote that I really like of his is that for every new client I see I develop a new theory. Right, right. <laughs> and and for, for, you know, new practitioner, uh, that's a hell of a challenge. Yeah. Um, you know, when I um, 
work with supervisees um, who've been through uni and have got their CBT checklist and sit down and want to pat their client into this little box for the questions that they happen to have on their piece of paper. Now, if it works that way, that's great. But mostly it doesn't. No. Um, and so I, I don't think there are hard and fast rules to answer this question for mm. you. I, I, I hate to say it's clinical intuition because that's diffuse, it's not scientific, it doesn't give other people clear answers, but I think in some ways it comes down to that. You know, if you've got a client who's, who's cognitive and trained in dealing with things cognitively, then yes, here's a good opportunity to offer cognitive information. Yeah. You know? If you've got somebody who's acting more out of a feeling or an emotional state, uh, I think the cognitive information is still very important, but you may need to be relating to that person more at that emotional level, yeah. uh, at least initially, yeah. to be able to get the information through. Yeah. If you've got someone having difficulty managing their behavioural problems, well, then maybe, you know, it's not a time to talk research, but to offer exercises that can help see some shift in behaviour can take place. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it really is a matter of seeing that client individually. What are the needs of this client? What are the things that I've got up my sleeve as a practitioner that can fit into that level of client? Yeah. Um, and, um, and, and be beneficial for them. And so, um, so, yeah, I don't think there's a particular time that you, you look for those cues because therapy is really about joining your client. Yeah. You need to step alongside them, you need to walk with them for a while and, and once you've done that, then you can start to quicken the pace or slow the pace or turn the direction uh, a bit. Yeah. Um, but it really is joining the, that person in their world and their experiences. And, um, can I give it a little example? I organised yeah. a conference here in Perth some years ago and uh, I invited different practitioners from different therapeutic modalities to give a clinical demonstration, to talk about their, their, their model of therapy and then to give a live demonstration of working with that. Um, and one of my colleagues said uh, in, in her presentation, she said, this model of therapy is the only model I've ever learned and the only one I've ever needed. Now, I shuddered at that. Um, and because it's like saying, I've got one map of the world and everyone else has to follow it. Yeah. To me, that was extremely frightening. Um, and I don't think that we can think that my CBT thoughts, my positive psych thoughts, my whatever model it might be, is going to work for every person I see. Mm. It certainly isn't. Mm. Um, and that's why I say as a therapist, I think it's really important to join the person in their world, see how they see the world, see the models that they're operating out of. Yeah. And my art has to be to adapt my knowledge, my skills, my information that somehow will be incorporated into their world and help them make a difference in that world. Yeah. Um, so, um, so, yeah, I think that, that's probably the basis, I think. Can, can you say something more about adapting? Yeah, I need to be flexible. Um, you know, I need to change. I need to be aware that my views are not the only views and, and, and the right views. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's a matter of assessing my client as to where they are and, and stepping into that world. Yeah. yeah. And, and stepping into the world, what, what would that, what could that look like? Like, how could you do that? Um, I, I, I once saw a guy who was a, um, had spent all his life in the Navy uh, in a um, fairly subordinate role. He was used to being told things, and when he was told things, he did them. You know, that's the way it worked. I mean, for me to use elaborate metaphors and things like that with this guy would not have worked. Mm -mm. My therapy with him was to be like I was a naval officer and tell him what to do. 
You go home, do this, do it this way, do it at this time, come back, tell me about it next week. And he did it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, does that work with everyone? Probably 99.9% .9 of people know. Mm. Um, but to learn a bit about his world, to join him in that, to see the way that he operated, then allowed me to offer interventions in a way that he could take them on board and utilise them. Yeah. Um, and so, um, yeah, I, I think, you know, that's what I mean about joining the, the client in, in their world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And you mentioned uh, not being able to have one map for everyone. Can you say something about that again? Yes, I, uh, we, we are all unique individuals. Certainly we have lots of commonality. Uh, but I, I think there's a, a real danger if, as a therapist, we, we have one mode or one prime way of working. And as I mentioned before, no matter what that theoretical model is that we, we come from, but if we have our checklist of the things, the, the sort of scripted approach that we need to go through, I, I think it's at it, it risk. It doesn't match the client. We need to and, and primely really match in with our client, get in their shoes, feel what it's like to be in their world. So that if we have that scripted approach, there are a couple of likely consequences of that. And um, the one is that if my client doesn't follow it, exactly as the model says that it should be followed, then I'm likely to be feeling a failure as a therapist. Um, and that doesn't enhance my status for helping people. Um, another consequence is that the client may well be feeling, well, I'm failing here because I'm, I'm not doing and meeting the expectations of my therapist. And so we leave our client then in a disempowered situation. So you get a disempowered therapist and a disempowered client, yeah. uh, or both, and that doesn't help the therapeutic process whatsoever. Mm. Um, more than the steps, the interventions, the scripted approach, um, we need to be aware of the principles. We need to operate out of those principles. And the, basic principle of positive psychology is that paradigm shift from looking at what's wrong to what's right, yeah. um, from looking at dysfunction to function to strengths and resources. And if we have that principle there, and if we follow the processes that help our client move from where they are to where they want to be, um, then to me that's what's important about about therapy. Yeah. Um, not not you know your specific tight model. That yeah. These are the steps that you've got to th go through with each client. <laughs> Any practitioner will tell you that doesn't work. No, no. Yeah. And are there principles for choosing when you do what? Because uh, if if I wanted to find out, so when do you use this intervention, or when do you use this assessment, or when do you share your your, your knowledge? Are there principles for that? Um, y y yes, there there are. Um, and um, you know, therapy is so wide and so broad, I'm not sure where to start on this one. But um, the principles are, if we come back to somebody who's depressed, look for the specific goals where they want to go. Look, look what it is that we're, they're wanting to change. Um, you know, is it in their cognition? Is it that they, they say to you, look, I'm sick and tired of looking at the world as though it's a half empty glass. I'd sooner see my glass as half full. Yeah. Well, then you're dealing with cognitive factors. Yeah. Um, you're dealing with an attitudinal view that that person has of the world, the way they think about the world. Yeah. Um, and, and so the principles here are, what do I know from the interventions in positive psychology and other approaches that are, are going to help that person make that attitudinal shift? Yeah. Um, what do I know about this person that I can help communicate that in an effective way yeah. to that person? And perhaps if I can give an example there, a um, supervisee of mine uh, once was working with a guy and she said, you know, he's very anxious, very tense, I've been trying to teach him relaxation and, and he can't relax. She said, will you come? And I thought, very brave of her, she said, will you come and sit in on a session with me and see what's going on and, and help step me through it. So I went in and sat in on this session 
and um, she started with some relaxation, mindfulness type approaches with this guy, and he sat bolt upright, uh, rigid and tense as anything. Yeah. Um, and um, so I said to her, you know, have you asked uh, when he feels relaxed? He used to be a truck driver, and uh, this was before cruise control, yeah. and he was saying out on the highways he, he had a, a length of wood in his cabin, and he said he'd wedge it onto the accelerator and wedge it down on the seat at just the right speed he needed, and he'd sit there in his truck and he'd be bouncing along the road, and that was the most relaxed he ever felt. <laughs> right, right. Yeah? Now, because she'd taken the scripted approach that you teach mindfulness, you teach relaxation skills for somebody who's tense, it wasn't working. Mm -mm. A simple question to your client and joining there. Now, the principles are exactly the same, but it's tailoring it to that person. Right, right, right. So I said to her, ask him to close his eyes and imagine that he's in the truck driving along the highway. Yeah. He closed his eyes. He imagined he was in the truck, and you could physically see him relaxing as he did that. Yeah. So, principles are the same. It's the application that needs to be geared into your client. Right. Knowing right. their resources, knowing their strengths, knowing their abilities, knowing what works for them. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. You mentioned before something about positive expectations when people call on the telephone. Mm -hmm. Can you say something more about uh, positive expectations? Yeah. Um, my secretary uh, n uh, never asked about, you know, what a person's presenting problem was and I'd, um, you know, trained her and she was, she was excellent at her job without my training anyway, I think. Um, but, um, you know, she, she would say things like, you know, people would say, well, you know, how long is it going to take? And, um, and, and she'd say, well, hopefully not too long. And, you know, if you're, you're willing to work at the things that, you know, you discuss with George in the sessions, then that will speed up the process for you. These are setting expectations for the fact that I will be off offering exercises that if they need, they need to apply themselves in working with it, um, that the process doesn't necessarily have to take a long time, but you know, maybe longer for some people. Um, yeah, and she would talk about these sort of things with the person, so that by the time they came to see me, you know, they had an idea of what was going to be happening. They had an idea about the processes of what was going to go on. Right. Um, and, and the way she spoke was positive too. You know, it assumed an outcome. Yeah. What, what about uh, your relationship with your clients? How, how do you create and maintain a good relationship? Um, I, I think observing, 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 as Ericsson said. Um, after that, listening, listening and listening. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and, and being willing to hear what that person says. Um, it's, it's not assuming that I've got all the answers, that I'm the expert, that I know what's right and wrong for you, um, but it is stepping beside that person and working with that person. Yeah. Uh, Tadichi and Kaloon, who wrote a chapter in, in my book, Happiness, Healing, Enhancement, talk about expert companionship. Yeah. And I really like that concept. They, they see therapy as being a companionship. Um, it's a coming together, um, but it's an expert companionship. Yeah. It's, it's where you know, they're accepting that the client is the expert on their life yeah. and know what's going on with their life. Um, and I, as a, as a therapist, have hopefully had some good training, some good experience, some good building of skills, that I have some expertise here. How can the two of us bring our expertise together yeah. to work towards the common goal that we have in that therapy session. Yeah. And, um, and, and so, yeah, I, I think to me that's the way of forming a relationship. You, you treat someone as an equal. Yeah. Um, you know, you're not the authority and they're not, you know, for some reason down the ladder because they happen to be struggling with an issue in life. Mm -hmm. I think, have I struggled with issues of life? Of course I have. Do I still struggle with issues of life? Of course I do. Yeah. Can I identify with almost every problem my clients brought in? Yes, I can, because I've been there and felt it and experienced it. We're human beings on this journey together. Yeah. Um, and so if I'm seeing them 
as, as having that expertise, if I'm looking for their strengths, if I'm looking for what's right with that person and combining it with skills that I have, I, th I think that forms a very positive, helpful yeah. and, and healing relationship. Yeah. What, what about uh, the client's engagement in, in working towards the, their goals between the sessions? Mm -hmm. You mentioned homework, do you do other things to help them stay engaged? Um, I'll, I'll usually set the homework up in, in very deliberate ways um, and, and, and often playful ways and, and again depending on the client, you know, if you, if you hear that, you know, they've been to see somebody else and they've been given homework exercises and it hasn't worked, then you need to figure out is it useful to give this client homework exercises or, or is it helpful to set it up in a way differently from what it might have been set up before. Yeah. You know, I'll often use paradox. Um, I'll often do tantalising things. You know, I can think of something that might be useful for you, but I don't think you're going to like it. Right. Yeah. And immediately, somebody saying, "What is it? Yeah. Tell yeah. me about it." Yeah. You know, no. You know, you're not going to like it. I'm not sure. I'll even suggest it because I don't think you're going to do it. Yeah. Um, and and they're almost on their knees begging to know <laughs> what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so again, it's looking for those ways of finding that you can help engage that client. Yeah. Um, and um, you know, I may set it up very deliberately. Well, you know, if if you do consent to doing it, you know, you're going to have to keep a record of it. You're going to have to bring it along and show me next week. We're going to have to talk about it. And that's going to be a lot of hard work, and you might not want to do that. Uh, um, and um, so, so, yeah, I don't want to use strategies like that that are based on just principles of suggestion that you, you learn through hypnosis, um, ways of communicating. Yeah. And, and what do your clients, or what have they told you has been most beneficial for them? <sighs> Again, this is very individual. You know? I, I mean, the case I gave you of that very depressed lady uh, who was beneficial on the first session, for her just to think about going home and enjoying her roses. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, others might be that, you know, we've sat and had a very cognitive conversation about what's happening in that person's life, and that's helped reframe their thinking about things to a different degree. Yeah. Um, other people, it might be something that they gain out of a homework exercise. Um, yeah, yeah, I don't know how to answer that because I, th I think for every client that's that's different. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and I, I don't know that, you know, I can even give a principle on that. But if, if I was to say something overall, um, I think this is again where I find positive psychology very useful because people have practical things that they can go home and that they can work on. They have practical things from the, the sessions that are positively oriented, um, that give them some positive expectation to move forward in certain ways. Whereas um, one, one of my heroes, uh, Jay Haley, who's well known in the family therapy and systemic therapy areas, um, I once he heard him say, you know, it's depressing to talk about depression. Yeah. And I think that he was absolutely right on that. Um, I don't think it's helpful to sit down with someone and say, tell me all about your depression. Mm -hmm. And you, you have a whole 45, 50, 60 minutes of sitting talking about being depressed. Yeah. A person's going to go away and feel even more miserable. They're going to be looking for a tall building and a short rope. <laughs> yeah. um, and so are you if you spend your day doing that too as, yeah. a, as a therapist. So I, I think the um, you know positive approaches here um, are, are ones that, that people can tap into, can gain from, can see relatively immediate gains, and that in itself is self-reinforcing. Yeah. If I work or walk away from the first session as that lady did with the roses, and and you know and I've been so depressed, and I can step off a train and I'm laughing out loud. Wow. That's a powerful change that's taken place yeah. in her life for her. And, and that's self-reinforcing. You know, she was wanting to come back to the next yeah, session yeah. and learn more. Yeah. Um, and 
Uh, so, so in, in general, I'd say that I think the you know positive approach is certainly more helpful here. Yeah. And how can how can you tell that your clients are progressing? I I monitor that very carefully with them in uh, setting the goals at the beginning with our outcome oriented assessment we've got some clear directions that we're heading now i mean we've not put those down on a like it scale or anything we're not measuring them in any objective way um, but i'm wanting to constantly monitor uh, progress with the client right um, you know, if we've got a goal set, you know, in terms of a, a cognitive change, a relationship change, building relationships, I'm going to give an exercise towards that end. I'm going to ask that person about it when they come back in. I'm going to want to know how they're progressing. Yeah. Um, that's A, of interest for me to know whether the things that I'm doing are helpful for this person or not. Yeah. But B, it's validating to that person to see any progress and to have that confirmed yeah. by somebody externally. Right, you right, know, right. I'm not just thinking it's happening, mm -mm. Yeah, here it is, it's taken place, I've told someone else, they've validated it for me, that's a positive step forward. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm wanting to very carefully monitor on the feedback from my clients as to how they're going and to very much ratify each little step that they take along that way. Right. So, yeah, carefully monitoring that one. And what do you think are some of the ma major effective factors or mechanism causing the, the changes? There's, I, I think there's a lot of variables coming to those too. Um, I'm, I'm fortunate that you know most of my working life has been in private practice. And I realise that working in agencies, and, and I've worked in, in prisons, I've worked in hospitals where people have been there on uh, enforced orders uh, that they have to be in a mental hospital, mental psychiatric ward. Um, I think there's a difference in working in private practice. I think firstly you've got people coming along in private practice because they want to do something about changing the situation or circumstances that they're experiencing in their life. Yeah. So there, there is a strong agency there already for people in private practice. I uh, Coming to private practice, I think that's an important variable. Yeah. Uh, I, I, th I think the way that you relate as a therapist with your client is a very important variable too. Yeah. Um, Scott Miller has done a lot of work on this one. Um, you know, I, I remember, and I can't remember the details of it, but back in the 70s there was some research done that looked at different therapeutic models and overall there wasn't much difference in terms of outcomes across the various models that they looked at. Yeah. Um, but when the researchers started to study it, they found that in fact in, in some uh, cases, some therapists were having far greater success than others. So they looked at the therapists more than models, yeah. and they found that one of the things that was most important was the expectancy. Whether therapists believed that the client could get on top of their problems and do that successfully, generally they did. Right, right. Um, so there's the expectancy that your client brings in, there's the expectancy that you have as a therapist, and that's why I say that outcome-oriented yeah, yeah. approach and assumption is important right from the beginning for the therapist. There are, of course, the techniques and strategies that you use. There are other ways that you can tailor those specifically to the needs of your client. There's how you then communicate those effectively that can be absorbed, taken on and incorporated into that person's life. And then there's the validation, the confirmation of progress that the person's making. Yeah. I think all of those are, are important variables. And, and what, what do you do to, to stay updated and develop as a professional? Uh, it's, uh, it's been a long mission of mine, even from my early days in the career, in my career, I thought that, um, you know, if I'm going to know about what I'm doing, then I really need to sit at the feet of the masters. Yeah. Um, 
And so I've, I have taken myself around the world to conferences, to workshops, to um, meet my gurus of the profession, uh, to personally get to know them, to learn from them. Uh, I read the journals, I subscribe to journals, I keep up with journals, I attend conferences, I present at conferences, I teach around the world. I, have constantly learned from my client. There's hardly a client I've seen I don't think that I haven't learned something from. And, mm. and in fact, I've said before that, um, you know, far better than a whole library of psychological texts is your clients. Yeah. They will teach you far more than you'll ever learn out of a textbook. And even the ones I've written. <laughs> <laughs> because they're, they're your most important learning source. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, yeah, yeah, I engage in dialogue. I keep email correspondence going with colleagues around the world. Um, um, yeah, I, I teach other colleagues, and in teaching, you learn. Yeah. Teaching is a two-way process. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's it's very important that uh, that you know I keep myself up to date for for my interests for. Uh, clients that I have seen and now for the teaching that I do and the people that I supervise um, that's imperative yeah yeah and the way that you're working if you had no knowledge of positive psychology would would it would you work the same way or a different way yeah as I as I said before the coin uh, the term was coined um, I, I've long been working with positive approaches yeah um, and um, would I be doing, I think I, I would be, overall I would be doing much the same. I think that what positive psychology has done has validated for me uh, some of the evidence, some of the research, it's confirmed things, it's opened up new opportunities too, and you know, introduced me to new ideas and I want to hasten to add that one. Um, but I think overall much the same. Yeah. I think at this point too, it, it's probably interesting to say that though we use that term positive psychology, I don't particularly like it. Mm -hmm. um, because as soon as you say positive, it assumes that there are a negative, or there is a negative. And, and, and that may be true. I think there are negative approaches to therapy. I think there are therapies that are not helpful. Um, and, and so, but it tends to assume that this is the only positive approach too, which I don't think is so. Mm. Um, Erickson's approaches, solution-focused approaches, family therapy-focused uh, approaches, a, a, a lot of uh, narrative therapy approaches, a lot of approaches to psychology have taken a very positive orientation and do take a positive orientation. So positive psychology is not the only positive one. Mm -hmm. and, and in my work, um, the sort of questions out of solution focused work come in too because they are positive yeah. um, and, um, and and yeah I, I, I just I don't think it's helpful like I don't think it's helpful to see emotions as positive and negative either mm -hmm. because their emotions like grief might be not a good feeling um, it, it may not be considered a positive emotion to be grieving but it may be a very helpful process of adjusting for somebody. Yeah. Um, so, and you know, just because I feel anxious at one point, that might feel negative, but my anxiety might protect me from being in a life-threatening situation. Yeah. So yeah. that's positive, even though the, the emotion isn't. Yeah. Um, so I, I do have some hesitation about the term positive psychology. Yeah. I, I, I use it because we mostly use it, but. Um, I think there are a lot of other approaches, a lot of other approaches that predate the naming of positive psychology. And, um, and, and yes, I have been working in those ways and, and would be similarly uh, doing much the same, though much more informed now yeah. and, and with some new strategies up my sleeve too. Right, yeah. What about uh, nature-guided therapy? I, I have a question about things we have not talked about. Mm -hmm. And I know you do that. Can you say something about that? Yeah, Nature Guided Therapy is, is one of my other books, my uh, second book, in, in fact. And, um, and, and, I, and to me, this fits very much into the realm of positive psychology, too. And, 
and probably dates back. I, I just know in my own childhood that you know things were getting on top of me to go for a walk along the beach or take my dog out for a walk or do something like that and get away from it. Uh, I generally came back feeling better and uh, I started to look at the research of, uh, that has mostly come out of areas that are not in the field of psychology. Surprisingly out of social geography, out of architecture, um, out of anthropology, um, some environmental and eco-psychology, but uh, research that shows that, that uh, people in hospitals, for example, where they look out onto a garden instead of internally onto a brick wall, or internally into the water, out onto a brick wall. People heal quicker, get discharged quicker, have less pain-killing medication, and rated more cooperative by staff. And um, so I could go on with a whole lot of research in this area, but contact with nature seems to enhance our physical well-being. We're healthier when we're in contact with nature. A variety of reasons, a lot of research there. We're psychologically better. Um, behaviourally we're better, we engage in less self-destructive behaviours, drinking, smoking, things like that when we're actually in nature. Um, spiritually we feel better and one thing out of the positive psychology we know that having spiritual beliefs uh, help people's levels of happiness. Um, the socially um, gain good evidence that shows that people in high-rise, high-density living where they can get out into tree space rather than just into car parks. Uh, they relate better with neighbours, they know their neighbours more by name, there's less domestic violence towards partners and children. Uh, we know children with ADHD that go out and get lessons outside on the oval or in a park, uh, have better concentration, learn and absorb more than if they're stuck into a classroom. Okay. So uh, there's a, a lot of solid evidence about it. So my interest uh, has really been, well, how do we incorporate this therapeutically? Yeah. Um, and I mentioned the sensory awareness inventory before that's mentioned in the book that basically gets people to tap in their various senses. What do you enjoy in your sight, your sound, your smell, your taste, your touch, and the activities that you do? Yeah. Um, this is a good basis for setting homework exercises for people, just like getting someone to spend time with their roses, because you know, those, those came across, though we did this verbally yeah. with the client I mentioned there, um, roses rated across several categories for her. Here are multiple positive sensory experiences yeah. that someone can have through a nature contact. And, um, so I, I want to explore those with, with my clients. What are the things that enhance their sense of well-being? And, and when I've done this, and I've administered thousands of these inventories now, and nearly everything that people list without even any guidance, just fill out the things you enjoy under these senses, they're primarily nature-based. Right, right, yeah. This fits our evolutionary history. Yeah. Um, it's rarely that people say watching TV or playing video computer games or, or things, um, but we do, you know, people do. And, and, but it, it is rare that these come up. And, um, and so, yes, I want to set exercises for people that help engage them uh, in the ways that meet maximum sensory experience for them. Yeah. And that usually is in nature contact type in, in activities. Right. Mm -hmm. Are there other things we've not talked about that are important to understand the way that you work? Um, I, th I think we've given a fairly good coverage there. And, uh, for me there's a combination of the hypnosis, of nature guided therapy, of uh, Milton Erickson's work of positive psychology, of um, using metaphors and looking at the subtlety of communication in therapy. And, and I, I think, for, hopefully for any therapist, you know, you, your most important resource beyond all the knowledge and the information that we have, um, the most important resource that you have is you. Uh, you're the therapist. What are your strengths? What are your skills? How can you maximise those? How can you utilise those to best help the client that you're working with at this moment in your office? And, um, and so, yeah, I think it's uh, you know, the old psychoanalytic approaches uh, to you know, know thyself by understanding all thy past history. 
Um, I don't think that's so, but I think if we know our strengths, know the things that we're good at, how we can draw on those as a therapist, I think that one's very important too. So I, I want to make that therapist variable yeah. an important one. Um, it's important for me to be the person that I am in relating with someone. And, uh, and I, yeah, I want to emphasize that as a variable, important variable as well. Yeah, yeah. And, and what advice would you give to other people who would like to start applying some of the research from positive psychology in, in their work? And I think the first thing is to, um, you know, uh, read, absorb, go to conferences, take in the information. And uh, with, with a name like Burns, George Burns, Burns is a good Scottish name. Uh, my Scottish ancestors a long way back are known for their frugality. Um, and I'm no exception. If I, if I pay to travel overseas and go to a conference, I want to bring back something useful. Yeah. Uh, if I go to a workshop and pay to do it, uh, again, I want to bring back something useful. So I'm, the first person I'm going to sit down with after that conference or that workshop, I'm going to say, what have I learned and how can I incorporate it with this person? How can I use that? So I, I think the first thing is to get that knowledge, get that information. Yeah. Um, I think the second thing is really to be aware of your client, uh, what they're experiencing, what their view, what their map of the world is like. Uh, I think the other thing is to be aware of yourself and know those expertise and see how you can bring in your client's expertise and your expertise to work in a companionable relationship uh, that moves to, to the therapeutic goals. Yeah. Last comments? Uh, anything? If there, if there is one other thing I want to say, it's that um, in, in my latter years I've been realising just what a privileged job it is to be a therapist, a counsellor or a coach. I don't think it gets any more privileged than having that intimacy with somebody else's life. I don't think it's any more privileged than when somebody sits down with you and maybe with tears in their eyes and says, I've never told anyone this in my life before. I don't think it can get any more privileged than to somehow be a little part of helping make somebody else's life better. Yeah. And positive psychology gives us the, the venue, the means, the processes to be able to do that. Yeah. So. Yeah, as I reflect back, I think, wow, you know, what a privilege to be so intimately engaged with other people and maybe to be able to offer a little help along the way yeah, yeah. and get paid for it as a job <laughs> yeah, at the same yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's perfect. Are there other things that we haven't talked about that are important? I, I think that we've covered most things, but uh, I, I mean, if... Um, anyone does want to follow up and look at my work a, a little bit more and uh, my books and sort of teaching and things that I do, uh, then they're welcome to take a look at the website, which is georgeburns, one, one word, dot com, dot au. Right, right. And you also mentioned that you're working on a new book or two books? Yes, working with a, a couple at the moment. Uh, one is um, another metaphors book, and this one more targeted specifically into the positive psychology areas. Um, that's the the main one that I'm I'm working with at this point. Yeah. Right. right.